Welcome, Irvin, and congratulations on the award today. Thank you. And I read somewhere that actually the inception of the RTT String Quartet was at the conferment of an honorary doctorate for Penderecki when you were at the Royal Academy of Music. Is that right? That's right, yes. Yeah. So you, you started the group to play some of Penderecki's music. Yes, I was just finishing my studies there, mm. and they needed, um, they needed some music for the ceremony, that, mm -hmm. inviting a figure such as Penderecki uh, to the Royal Academy of Music, which was basically a performing mm. college. They thought they should put on some of his music. But, so it got left in my plate, so to speak, or on my plate to, to do something, and I, I played a piece of violin and piano, mm -hmm. and I got three of my colleagues to play his second string quartet, and I just asked friends who yeah. were there if they would do this, not really having um, any idea that this was something that was going to continue. Yeah, yeah. that's interesting because what's the um, combination of luck and chance versus strategic planning, would you say? I was, thinking about, your I was thinking about that this morning, listening yeah. to the ceremony mm. and listening to the advice um, for the students to yes. develop and, and to be original and whatever. And I was thinking that I had no real strategy. Mm. My strategy was just the love for what I did. Mm -hmm. And I'm not a religious man at all. Um, but I think I was kind of sent to do what I do okay. because it just developed. I could have veered off in other directions, um, music directions, like with the orchestra or mm. other things. Mm. But my hobby was contemporary music. Yes, because you were concert master of the LSO, you know, from a really young age. But it, so you felt that you were guided to, to sort of go on and develop the string quartet. Yes. Yeah. I think orchestras are great. I mean, I had the opportunity to be close to many great conductors and many great soloists. Mm. And I actually learned a lot from the way they performed and the way they were. Mm. Um, but my hobby was contemporary music. I was, I was in Oxford when I was 13, mm -hmm. listening to Sanakis and Messian and meeting both composers. Right. There, listening to Messian play um, Vision de Lannin with his wife, Yvonne Laurier. And I first met Sanakis and listened to his orchestral piece, Terek Tektor, from within the orchestra. Wow. Yeah. I think it was the town hall in Oxford. Mm -hmm. And my mother wouldn't let me go on my own, so she came with me. And, and she was hooked as well. <laughs> no, I mean, she was hooked to me mm. and happy to go mm. where I wanted to. Mm. Um, but she was kind of very, not very knowledgeable, but mm. she supported me mm. very much so. And then three years later, the first place I ever went to outside of England mm. was Darmstadt. Okay. Not to the sunny shores of France to have some red wine and eat moule and whatever mm. English people do, but um, to go to the courses, to not understand a word of German, but to be there amongst Stockhausen and Ligeti and lots of other people, mm. and to listen to the concerts, which is an international language. You don't have to understand yeah. German for that. So, um, so this, is, this was my hobby from the very beginning, and I, I guess I turned my hobby into my profession. Mm. That's why I say it was sent, because um, I really enjoy my work and it goes on and on. Yeah, so there's, I mean, that, you're driven by that passion. So, so what advice would you give some of the young musicians graduating today? Follow their, their, their passion, study well, mm. be prepared, do your homework, do mm -hmm. your practice or whatever. Have an idea of what, where you're going. Um, doesn't mean you have to predetermine everything from the very beginning, mm. but be sensitive to the choices you have to make along the way. Mm -hmm. um, think about them carefully, but then let spontane spontaneity carry you through. Um, you have to make some calculated decisions, but then some things you should have a feeling for which way you want to go in life, mm -hmm. if you're lucky enough to be given those choices. You've come to Huddersfield since 1982, I think, I and believe played it's that at the long. festival. You've probably been the musician that's played the most at the Huddersfield Contemporary Music Festival. Is there a particular highlight, musical highlight for you, or a special experience? Oh, that's in amongst a all that. <laughs> that's a difficult one. Mm. Um, I'm not sure there are highlights as such because there are many concerts that I look back on. Um, 
with great warmth and um, feeling for um, sometimes amusement also. Yeah. Um, but many composers have been here, of course. Many well-known composers have come and we perform their music here. Um, I think I wouldn't like to single one out mm -hmm. um, because there have been so many experiences. Some, of course, I don't remember very well because <laughs> 82, it's a long while mm -hmm. back. Mm -hmm. It's more than 30 years. I remember the beginning, sorry, the beginning yeah. with Sanakis. Yes. I think mm -hmm. the first time we played, and uh, this was very much a polytechnic then, not a mm -hmm. university. Mm -hmm. And there was a small chamber hall um, at the back of St. Paul somewhere mm -hmm. in the university. I don't know if it still exists. Yeah, maybe not. And we did a concert there of Sanaki's chamber music. Mm. It was quite hot and we played all the small pieces. And probably Ikko, which was written then, but it was before Tetras. It was 82, so Tetras mm -hmm. was written 83. Mm -hmm. I remember it was pre-Tetras. And um, Sanakis was there, it was hot. and. It was the first time I'd really met Richard Steinitz, probably mm -hmm. talked to him about things. He and so what was the atmosphere like and the audience reaction? It was great. Yeah. Uh, people were thirsty. Mm. I mean, it's an extremely important thing that Richard did by creating this festival mm. and seeing that it went on. It's kind of visionary. And it's quite extraordinary that a town like Huddersfield, mm. in fact, Huddersfield has, mm. Um, such a festival because this festival doesn't exist anywhere else mm. in the country. Nothing like it, not this festival, but nothing like it is, exists anywhere, not in London. There was a festival in London at the Almeida Theatre that that you could say was on similar level to, to Huddersfield Festival, but it lasted only a few years. Mm. And mm. this festival has gone on and on and it continues to flourish. And I think that's really incredible and something that really needs to be preserved. Mm -hmm. And this being the 40th year of, of the RGT String Quartet, you've been asked to sort of look back a lot yeah, and ruminate on, on, on the past. What do you look forward to? Doing what I've been doing for the last 40 years, mm -hmm. having fun mm -hmm. and playing new music and inspiring composers to write new pieces and just playing with my colleagues sometimes alone, but most of my activities are with the quartet, and it's great fun making music with three other people, transferring ideas from one to the other, working on those ideas, transforming them into other things, um, working with composers, advising composers, or taking their advice on how they want their music played. All, all this is a rich experience of musical life, and I think um, there's there's nothing that can equal it or better it. Mm -hmm. um, and so in 1999, when we won the Siemens Prize in Germany, I asked what the prize was for. And they said, it's for lifetime achievement. And I said, hang on a minute, I haven't finished yet. <laughs> <laughs> and after, Many 40, lifetimes to go. <laughs> after 40 years, <laughs> I could still say, hang on, I haven't quite finished yet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> The University of Huddersfield, inspiring tomorrow's professionals.